By all outward appearances, Terence Yakey had everything to live for in the spring of 1996. A respected seven-year veteran of the Oklahoma City Police Department, Terence Yakey had earned awards, accolades, and honors for his work in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing on April 19, 1995, where he worked tirelessly in the rubble and the debris for over three and a half hours, dragging eight people from the building that day, saving their lives. In November of 1995, he had been promoted to the position of sergeant in the Oklahoma City Police Department. He had received the key to the city of El Reno, Oklahoma, for his heroism in the aftermath of the OKC bombing. And he was just getting ready to receive a Medal of Valor for his actions that day. He had recently reconciled with his ex-wife, Tanya, and he was getting ready to move to Dallas, Texas, to begin work for the FBI. And yet... He was under intense persecution from the Oklahoma City Police Department itself for his refusal to confirm the official story of the Oklahoma City bombing. You see, Terence Yakey saw something in those moments after the bombing, something that disturbed him enough to cause him to stand up against the Oklahoma City Police Department that he had spent seven years serving. He knew, and he repeatedly attempted to tell his superiors, that the bombing did not happen the way that the public was told that it happened. He was in the process of collecting records and documentation which proved that the OKC bombing was not what it appeared to be. But he never had the chance to tell his side of the story, to blow the whistle on the things that he saw and experienced in the aftermath of that bombing. He died on the 8th of May, 1996. His death was ruled a suicide. So who was Terry Yeke, and what did he know? Well, let's begin exploring that question by taking a look at a very important article from APFN.org, written by Pat Shannon, and titled simply enough, Who Killed Terry Yeke? Quote, Terry Yeke was a giant of a man, with a heart as big as the rest of him. I wish I had known him. He was a crusader for truth. Whenever his name is mentioned, I think of the news photo of him sprinting down Northwest 5th Street towards the Murrah building on another of the many rescue missions he performed that ugly day. In his blue uniform, he tends to remind us of an NFL linebacker about to put the sack on an unfortunate quarterback, but this is quickly overridden by the grave concern on the face of a policeman in a panic to save lives. After numerous private investigators produced irrefutable evidence of multiple explosions, unexploded bombs being hauled away after the fact, and the complete and total incapability of an ammonium nitrate fuel oil bomb to cause the kind of devastation seen in downtown Oklahoma City, a giant government cover-up became obvious. Only a couple of hours into the rescue, Sergeant Terence Yeagy became painfully aware of something disturbing. Did he somehow figure out that the building had been blown up from the inside and that the news reports were baloney? Did he overhear a strange conversation from some of the many ATF agents who were on the scene sooner than they should have been? Whatever it was, Terry was upset. He called his wife that morning crying, the big old teddy bear of a guy was crying, and saying repeatedly, It's not true. It's not what they are saying. It didn't happen that way. Terry Yeke may have been the first to discover the sham. He ran back and forth into that concrete mess of bricks and mortar all day long and continued beyond exhaustion far into the night. He scraped and crawled and dug until his fingers bled and then kept digging some more. In a cadre of heroes that day, Terry's performance was outstanding. On May 11th, the following year, he was scheduled to receive the Medal of Valor from the Oklahoma City Police Department. He never got it. He was murdered on May 8, 1996 in the country, two and a half miles west of the El Reno Penitentiary. No homicide investigation was ever conducted, and there was no autopsy. In an interview with Terry's widow, Tanya Yakey revealed that her husband had been very upset by something he had seen under the daycare center on April 19th. He had wanted to go back and photograph it, but the officials would not let him onto the site again. 
The Oklahoma Building Investigation Committee speculates that what Terry saw may have coincided with the possible evidence of another unreported bombing device uncovered by their science people. Mrs. Yeke also said that Terry was supposed to be decorated for his work as a rescue person, but didn't want to be put in the limelight. Terry felt the investigation was fraudulent and didn't like the fact that the OKPD was honoring people who really weren't deserving of the honor. Sergeant Yeke had told his friends that he was going out of town to hide or secure evidence of a cover-up of the bombing by federal agents. It was his day off, and he was traveling in his private automobile. In his last known conversation, Terry reportedly told a friend that he was being followed by the feds and had to shake them. Previously, his household had been subjected to numerous threatening phone calls by persons unknown, threats which have not ceased even with his death. Tonya Yeke has moved five times in three years since the Oklahoma City tragedy. She continues to get intimidating letters and threatening phone calls. Since her husband's death, her home has been broken into and personal threats have been written on her living room walls. She remains in fear of her life, constantly seeking asylum with no place to turn. End quote. Well, that is as good an introduction as any, I suppose, to the mystery of what Terry Yakey may have uncovered on that 19th day of April 1995, as he struggled, toiled, and sweated to rescue life after life after life from that burning, twisted rubble of the Alfred P. Murrah building. What was it that Terry Yakey found? What was it that he saw that completely destroyed for him the myth that the media then propounded about the OKC bombing. To do justice to Terence Yakey's life is to explore the unfortunate details of his death, because there is no doubt that what he saw on that 19th day of April 1995 was connected inexorably to his death on the 8th of May 1996. To begin exploring this, First, let's listen to an extended excerpt from that conversation mentioned in that APFN article between Terence Yakey's wife, Tonya Yakey, and Ken Rank and Craig Roberts of AM1300 KAKC from a conversation that they had about Terence Yakey's life and death in 1998. Well, now she's on it. Good morning, Tanya. Good morning. Well, I, I've given them a little bit um, of, a, of a preview in the first hour of the case itself, just the basics of uh, what happened and what, you know, what you can do. We've got an hour, and what, we, uh, what you can do is kind of fill us in on, on you know, where you were at, what happened uh, through your perspective, and especially uh, what happened to you, you know, it, not only during uh, the time of, of uh, the bombing and shortly after, but all the way up until, like, today. So why don't you start with, uh, 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 let's, let's back up just a little bit and take five minutes first and tell us that, you know, Terry was the first officer in the building. He probably saw some things uh, that uh, were dangerous for someone to see and remember and know, and he began working the case. And why don't you just kind of take it to there? What did, what did he tell you? Well, um, it actually started the day of the bombing that he had made some uh, strange statements that uh, at first I wasn't able to uh, really put into any kind of logical order, um, but later on it began to make sense why he was making these comments. Um, I picked him up. I got a call about oh, 11.30, maybe 11.15, in the morning of the morning from Presbyterian Hospital. Um, they said Terry had been injured, and I need to come down there and get him. Um, in that two-hour time, I'd been trying to find him. Um, his, uh, his computer in his uh, police vehicle was not uh, working. Nobody could get a hold of him. Nobody seemed to know where he was. So I was really concerned because... Uh, I knew he worked that area early in the morning, so I was concerned um, and was relieved to get the call. So I uh, went down there to Presbyterian Hospital, picked him up. Um, the strange thing was um, his first statement that came out of his mouth was, get me out of this hospital. No matter what you got to do, get me out of here. Um, I said, okay. Um, uh, he's very adamant. I, I didn't know at the time that... Um, uh, I've been told later that he was threatened at the hospital. Uh, I didn't know where the source of threatening came, 
but that's that's what I've been told later on, about a year after his death. Um, as soon as we got in the vehicle, um, and Terry had injured his back carrying Randy Ledger out of the building. Uh, Randy was a large man, probably uh, almost 300 pounds, and he had fallen through some rubble. Um, so he couldn't even walk, couldn't sit up. And uh, as soon as they loaded him into the car, uh, he got very upset, um, started to cry a little bit, and said, uh, Tanya, it's not what they're saying it is. They're not telling the truth. They're lying about what's going on down there. And um, yeah, I did try to press him a little bit, ask him questions, but he didn't seem very willing to talk about it. Um, it, it was just kind of a, a comment. You know, it's not what it's not what they're portraying it to be. Um, and from that point on, uh, it was about two or three days later, uh, after the bombing, he had asked me to take him down to the site. Um, and mind you, Terry couldn't even walk. He really was not in any shape to go down there. Um, but he kept insisting we needed to go back down there. Uh, said that we needed to go at night when we could not be seen. Um, and people would just recognize us easily. And I didn't understand the reason for that, but I didn't ask a lot of questions either because he just, he just seemed unwilling to give a lot of information. Um, we did go down there, uh, probably between 9.30, 10 o'clock, and he said that we were going to go look underneath where the daycare had been. Um, there was something he wanted to see under there and get a picture if possible. Um, as we went down there, um, we were stopped, and I can't remember which personnel it was, but I know definitely it was either ATF or FBI. I just cannot recall what the uh, name was on the back of his jacket, but it was one of the two. And um, Terry had attempted to badge his way through, and the guy told him no. Um, and he said something a little more specific, like, uh, you know you're not supposed to be back down here, something along the lines that made me realize the two of them recognized each other, and the interaction was very antagonistic. Um, I think had I not been with Terry, he would have said a little more to the man um, and maybe been a little more forceful about getting through, but it seemed like he thought better about it since I was with him and we left. And then he uh, asked me as we got in the car that I not be seen down at the site. Um, and mind you, I worked a, a job that uh, might require me to go down to the site, um, but I did not because he was very adamant that I not be seen down there at any point in time. Um, the, the entire year after that was uh, lots of strange incidences, uh, lots of strange comments from him. Um, about 15 days after the bombing happened, I got a call from his supervisor, Lieutenant Joanne Randall. And um, she's being pretty hostile, uh, pretty aggressive, and um, asked me where Terry was, told her he, he was not there. And she, ta she said, uh, you tell Terry that if he doesn't get that other report in, um, that he's going to be reprimanded if he does not get that in by the end of the night. Uh, who is this? This is Lieutenant Joanne Randall. Mm -hmm. And this was his, uh, his supervisor, direct supervisor at the time. Now, um, let, me, let me give you a little filler in there. Um, in this time frame, Terry had written a nine-page report. Um, I know that he wrote a nine-page report. I saw it. This is the only report, however, that I've ever asked him to read that he did not let me. Um, I, I didn't understand the reason for that at the time. It was, you know, I've, I've ridden with my husband, you know, on ride-alongs. We, we talk a lot about what had happened at work. You know, I've, I've read reports about the prostitutes on 9th of Francis, you know. It just meaning that nothing was really all that sacred. You know, if I asked about it, usually he was pretty forthcoming in telling me about it. Uh, this time it was an absolute no. He didn't want me reading this nine-page report. Um, and that's an awfully long report. I don't ever know uh, too many uh, police incident reports that are that long, but his was. You, as you look back on that, do you find that as a his way of protecting you by making sure that you didn't have that knowledge? Uh, that's what I believe. That is what I believe. At the time, it was strange to me, but uh, two years later, it, it comes into perspective really clear that he did not want me to know, have any knowledge of what was going on down there. Okay, so now she wants a second report. She wants a second report. And like I said, this is not hearsay. I got the call. I know what she said to him. Um, he had told me, and I want to say it was maybe... Oh, about the 11th or 12th day that he had 
um, came into the house and was really upset, just mad, um, said that they supposedly lost his first report. It was just missing. Um, he was furious. And um, another thing that it was very unlike him that he would not keep a copy of the report, but I think because he had been injured and probably was not expecting that the report would come up missing, I think he probably would have made a copy under normal circumstances. Um, but he seemed offended, and he had said that she wanted him to write a much shorter report. It, you know, it needed to be one page. Um, he was being dictated, obviously, what to write in his report and being told to take a lot of things out now, of it. Now, now the, people have to understand that when you turn a report in, the first thing it does, it goes to, re to, to your supervisor, then it goes to records division, and they make multiple copies for various locations. So to lose the report, the supervisor would have to lose it, or they would have to go to these multiple locations that they know the report's at and get rid of all the reports. Right. Now, they want a second report. That lends me to believe that they want a different report because they've already threatened him by now. Yes. And so now they say, that's not the report we want. You'll write it, but you'll leave out such and such. That's my theory. Right. Okay, go ahead. And, and I'm, I agree with that um, uh, for certain reasons uh, of other things that have gone on. Um, I know Terry was being uh, threatened with disciplinary action all over the place uh, for lots of things concerning the bombing. They won't fess to this, but this, in fact, was occurring. Um, and the report was the first thing that I know about that he was threatened with disciplinary action. Um, okay, I'm trying to get my train of thought here. And, you know, jump in, ask me any questions you want okay. as I'm going along. I'll, I'll help you on this since I know the story not, not as well as you, but fairly well. Let me ask one right, quick question. Tony, have you ever told this story before on radio? Yes, I have. Oh, you have? Yes, I Did have. Did you have any reaction from it? I'm sorry? Did you have any particular reaction from it? Particular uh, reaction as from in it? As in threats, uh, yeah. telephone problems, takeouts, whatever. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I've gotten used to it over two years, you know. It, it doesn't seem so new to me anymore. Did you do this uh, at an Oklahoma City station? No, I have not. This is the first time I've been able to do it in any Oklahoma City radio station. Oh, in any Oklahoma station at all? That's correct. Oh, well, I see. It's always been on uh, shortwave and national stuff, right? Right. Yeah, okay. Right. In other words, a very limited listenership. Are you, uh, did any stations turn you down? Would they not let you tell this story or what? Uh, when, uh, when Terry's death first happened, um, and I had to do a lot of digging to find out what happened to Terry, okay? Um, I, I was really kind of armed with some vague information at the time, mo most, mostly because of how the body um, actually was when it was found, what the location it was found. Just the whole story itself was unbelievable, and I had not pinpointed it all to the bombing until about a year after. I was still kind of gathering and... and kind of blindly <laughs> uh, searching my way through it so um yeah that sounds like maybe you had some of the same problems Karen Silk would have yeah now getting getting uh, getting on with with uh you, you know you mentioned to me that uh, Terry had come to you uh on probably more than one occasion and said we need to get remarried so you'll be covered by insurance and pension and all this for the kids yes okay. um we we had been divorced at that time um it was about two weeks after his, uh, before his death that he suddenly became very afraid, um, very anxious, very nervous. Um, I would not say suicidal, um, just afraid. And he would come to my house at strange times of the night, unannounced. And this is, if you knew Terry Yakey, you'd know how out of character this would be. Terry was a polite sort, uh, very respectful. Um, wouldn't, it wouldn't even come over unless, you know, you knew he was coming in advance. But here he was coming up at my door, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3.30 in the morning. And uh, he was telling me that he was going to get his insurance papers uh, all put together and make sure that I had them. Um, he wanted me to leave in the middle of the night with him right then. He said, we need to get remarried. Uh, don't ask me questions. This is the only way I can make sure you and the girls are taken care of in the event that something happens to me. But that never happened. That never happened. You never, you never got the the paperwork, or, or it was never done. No, uh -uh. Okay. because it was, uh, it had started like I said two weeks beforehand, and he was very vague in what he said, and I, I spent several hours trying to get him to tell me what was going on. Very frustrating, uh, but it was obvious that there was something going on. I don't believe he was suicidal, but two days before it, um, he showed up again, and he did something very strange. He tossed a VCR in my car did not explain why um, 
said that he needed to get these insurance papers to me and and left said he would be back very upset um, 48 hours later he was dead it was the last time I ever saw it now you said VCR is in a machine or a VHS tape no a VCR machine okay. an entire right. machine okay which like I said yeah if, if if it were you you know you think what in the world what 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 is he doing that wasn't a, it wasn't a camcorder it was a v, VCR it was like VCR and there had been a tape in it but I had not watched it the VCR came up missing within 24 hours. Oh. It disappeared out of my house. So I was more concerned at the time of what he was talking about than I was, because the VCR was kind of incidental and didn't mean a lot to me at the time. Um, when I went back to look at it, to look for it, it had turned up missing. And there you go. There's Tonya Yakey talking with Craig Roberts and Ken Rand about the life and death of Terry Yakey. And I would wholeheartedly suggest that people follow the link to the YouTube video from which I scraped that audio so that you can listen to the entire conversation, which is about an hour long, and goes into much greater detail about the harassment that the Yankees were receiving, and, of course, about the grisly details of Terence Yankee's death. Now, this is never a fun part of any episode, but it needs to be done. We have to examine the scene of Terence Yakey's death to find out more about what was labeled a suicide, but which absolutely on its face could not possibly have been a suicide. And to get into the ugly details of that grisly scene, let's take a listen to a clip from a very valuable 10-minute YouTube documentary put together by We Are Change Oklahoma under the title We Are Change Oklahoma, what did Sergeant Terence Yakey know? Now, this is a very valuable documentary that came out earlier this year. It's 10 minutes long and goes through the story of Terence Yakey and his death, and also interviews some of Terence Yakey's family members about their comments about what has been labeled a suicide, but which virtually no one believes was actually a suicide. So let's listen to a short clip from this We Are Change Oklahoma video in which they discuss the scene of Terrence Yakey's death. Sergeant Yakey had witnessed things during his response to the bombing, which did not agree with the official version of events touted by the national media and law enforcement at that time. He was in the process of collecting evidence which supported and documented the inconsistencies he witnessed the morning of the bombing at the scene itself. According to the Yankee family members, Terrence Yankee was to meet a colleague in the restaurant directly behind me the morning of May 8 of 1996. He was to discuss records that he had collected regarding the, the Oklahoma City bombing, which were stored in a storage facility about an hour's drive north of here. Terrence Yankee never made it to that restaurant in El Reno because on the morning of May 8 of 1996, at 7 a.m., his vehicle was found in a spot just behind me by a resident living up this road no more than a mile away. It was from 7 a.m. until 6 p.m. that the car would sit here, full of blood, and according to Terry's sister Vicki, there was actually blood in between the window panes in the back of the vehicle. In addition to the blood, there was an unidentified knife found in the bottom of the glove box, along with razor blades, the car keys, and the windows rolled up tight. The car was locked. Terry's body was nowhere to be found until later that evening, between 7 and 8 p.m., OCPD helicopters, in addition to the Canadian County Sheriff, as well as El Reno Police, would have a large search party looking for Terry's body no more than a half a mile from where we're standing. It is important to note how, exactly how, Yankee is supposed to have killed himself. He was said to have slit his wrists and neck, causing him to nearly bleed to death in his car and then miraculously climb over a barbed wire fence. He then was purported to have walked over one and a quarter mile distance through a nearby field, eventually shooting himself in the head at an unusual angle. Startlingly, no weapon was found at the scene of the body, no investigation was conducted, no fingerprints taken, and no interviews with family members or friends were conducted to try and determine why Yaki would have been suicidal or if he had in fact been suicidal at all. Instead, the conclusion that Yankee's death was a suicide was reached immediately without an autopsy. 
Again, quite a grisly scene, but it bears repeating exactly what we are being asked to believe was a suicide. So apparently, Sergeant Terence Yeke slashed himself several times on the forearms and then cut his own throat twice near the jugular vein, then crawled a mile through rough terrain away from his car, which he had the presence of mind to lock after leaving, before shooting himself in the head with a small caliber revolver, somehow along the way managing to get rope burns, or what appeared to be rope burns on his neck, as well as handcuff bruises on his wrists, muddy grass embedded in his slash wounds, and then somehow managed to dispose of the suicide weapon in a way that it was not found at the scene. It was later found by an FBI investigator after several people had gone over the scene of his death with a fine-tooth comb. Well, if you have been listening to this podcast for any length of time, you know what this is called. This is not a suicide. This is someone who has been suicided. Just as Gary Webb could not possibly have shot himself twice in the head, as is alleged by the people who would like to label his death as a suicide and thus sweep under the rug all of the valuable work that he did exposing CIA drug running, so too would they like us to believe that Terence Yeke butchered himself and then shot himself in the head and then disposed of the weapon, all in the name of discrediting the very person who could have proven that there was something very wrong with the official story of the OKC bombing. Earlier this week, I had the chance to talk to James Lane of We Are Change, Oklahoma. Let's listen to a clip from my interview with James Lane, which of course is available for download in its entirety from CorbettReport.com, in which we talk about the work of We Are Change, Oklahoma in continuing to expose the truth about the Oklahoma City bombing in general and the death of Terrence Yakey in particular. Well, tell us a little bit about your own involvement with the story, how you came, obviously, to start with the OKC bombing in general, and, and specifically this case, and tell us a little bit about meeting the family of Terrence Yakey. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I'm born and raised here in Oklahoma, and it's always been something that's, you know, I mean, obviously, when, when an event like that happens in your home city, you know, you, you feel that, you know, you want to investigate it more. And I think a lot of people may have, have just turned away from it because it was so horrific and they just wanted to put it behind them. But I wanted, I wanted to know more about it. And after getting involved with We Are Change, you know, I said, well, We Are Change Oklahoma needs to make Oklahoma City bombing, I think, the primary focus. You know, I mean, we, the New York chapters, you know, they deal with the events of September 11th. But it, it seemed like, I guess, a, a lot of time had passed from Oklahoma City but you know there's a lot of, of information there that needs to be you know told so we're trying to we put together a trifold flyer that we hand out at the bombing memorial to try to raise awareness and drive folks to you know uh, the websites that we have we're trying to get folks to understand that this could happen again you know, and we're not saying the government did anything. I don't think the government can even run the post office, but we have evidence of foreknowledge within certain elements of of agencies. That's you know at this point, you know, needs to be investigated. And you've got senior officials of the uh, Clinton administration saying that the only thing that's going to save Obama is another Oklahoma City or nine eleven. You know, th those are scary words. Absolutely. It certainly is. And I think for anyone who has spent any time researching it, they'll see all of the, the various forewarning, foreknowledge, and uh, provocateurship of the various agencies that uh, were supposedly afflicted on that day, including, of course, the ATF. But uh, absolutely, it's, a, it's a, an extremely important case, and it continues to be one as uh, we move into a new age of, of potential Oklahoma City-type bombings, and we hear the rhetoric of that increasing. So, uh, tell us, I understand you're working on a documentary about the Oklahoma City bombing. Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. Uh, we are starting a, or we've started on a documentary film. Uh, we're, our company is called Free Mind Films. It can be found at freemindfilms.com. And we're, the movie is going to be called A Noble Lie because that is from Plato's The Republic. And A Noble Lie is a lie that is told by, knowingly told by the elite in order to maintain social harmony or their position 
of their social status. And we think that that is uh, relevant here because we saw a lot of people that whether or not they were part of the planning or any of that, that's the, we're not saying that, but they, they were complicit in the cover-up. They used the event to their own benefit. You know this this tragedy. These you know these people, real people, died that day, and you know you got Bill Clinton running around saying that that's uh, that's what got him reelected. You know, so because everybody you know they they really focus on the September 11th events, and everybody has a lot of knowledge about that. But it seems like the Oklahoma City bombing. Maybe so much time has passed. We need to revisit it because there are some of the most gl- glaring examples of cover up. There that you know we don't we don't see that and they've got they got you know the more sophisticated in, in cover up with with nine eleven whereas Oklahoma City I mean it's just it's just very blatant and we think that it's time that the that the story be told and that's why you know we're getting the interviews we're talking with you know Tarantiki's family and we got interested in in his case initially because we found out you know he was one of the first responders and then and that's where we got into the the nitrous gas cloud. I mean, for me, that was one of the major, you know, uh, pieces of evidence that show that the official story is not true. I mean, there's mountains uh, of evidence beyond that. Uh, I mean, the you had the largest manhunt in history for John Doe number two, and then all of a sudden we're just, just supposed to ignore that and act like you know, well, that didn't happen. They they said that the people were confused at the Ryder Truck Rental place. Well, they only rent a couple of trucks a day. It's not a high traffic office. And I don't think that they're going to be confused about who came in with who and at what time. And it wasn't like a, a lot of time had passed. This was – they were questioned 48 hours after he had rented the truck. So, I mean, the, multiple witnesses. We've got 23 affidavits where people saw Timothy McVeigh with another man. You know, this this can't be denied. And the FBI just acts like, well, it, it didn't happen. Absolutely. And of course, there are so, so many aspects to this case. And, and as I've gone through on my podcast before, and as I know you talk about quite a bit uh, in the various media that you do, but obviously one of the linchpins of that case is, is the Terence Yeke death, which was so obviously not what it was portrayed to be. And uh, just w- one more time, tell us about meeting the family and what that was like. Absolutely. It was, it was difficult. I mean, there, there were some of the most kind, loving people that I've met, I mean, they just welcomed us into their home. I think they were grateful that someone, you know, it, it was trying to dig into this because they had been fighting for so long and had been told no and turned away so many times. They really, they really showed us a, a lot of kindness and, and, and love. Um, so it was really difficult to, to listen to the family, you know, recount the, the death of their loved one. Um, I mean, it was just, you know, the, his mother, Ludella, she says, you know, it's it, that it, it's very painful to go over it time and time again, but she vowed that she would not give up until the truth was known about the death of her son. Um, his sisters were, are, they're, they're great ladies and very, uh, very brave in what they're trying to do. And they, they are still going down to, you know, try to get his uh, belongings. I mean, that was just something that, that happened recently. I mean, they had they had, had his his weapon uh, in storage for you know all these years. So, uh, I, right now they're trying to get the investigation going, and that that costs money. You know, and that's why it's taken so long. Um, but there are some people that are interested and have agreed to come on board and pursue this case. For anyone who has been involved in this research for any length of time, you will have no doubt encountered the old refrain, I don't believe in conspiracies because someone would have talked. Well, Gary Webb attempted to talk, and he was suicided. Terence Yakey attempted to talk, and he was suicided. Many, many others have also attempted to tell the truth, and they have been disposed of in like manner. But suffice it to say, that to honor the memory of those who have fallen in attempting to expose the truth, we must take up that torch and continue to expose the truth and shine the light of the truth on those dark corners that the dark operators would like to keep in the dark. In this way, we can honor those who have fallen in the pursuit of truth and justice. I leave today's final words to Terence Yeke's own grandmother from the We Are Change Oklahoma video about Terence Yeke's death. 
there were lies told about everything that happened. And I would like for the world to know that his life was just taken away from him for nothing.